So I was playing with this shader and I think I stumbled upon a novel way. Well, novel, it's, I'm sure somebody's done it before, but it's novel for me. And that is to create controls for the material from geometry nodes. Now, why would you want to do this? It seems kind of weird to go to geometry nodes for the shader. Well, later in the video, I'll show you uh, why I do this. Uh, but first, let's set the stage by showing you a few tricks that we can use for creating a uh, hair material. I've already shown you uh, how we can create the hair strand effect. Now, if you get a noise texture, map it to our coordinates. Then with a mapping node, scale it on the X axis by some small value. And the noise will stretch uh, along the curve. Then the scale of the noise will control how fine those hairs are. And this is a very useful texture that we can use in a lot of places. So let's set it to the side for now. For easy access of all our uh, relevant controls, we're going to place uh, the node setup in a group. Select our nodes, accept the material output, and press Ctrl G. We have a group node. Now just give it some name. Now grab the noise scale, which is the thing that we are interested in, and connect it to the group input. Then if we see in the side panel, under the group tab, we have inputs. That's uh, these things. There's our scale. You can rename it. Set a default value. Something that uh, looks right. We can set a minimum and a maximum value. Uh, this will limit our slider. There's no point in going below zero scale uh, and the maximum uh, could be something arbitrary. I'll just put a thousand. Another useful thing is a gradient texture. We need a linear for this case. And we can use this for shadows or highlights around the base or the tip of the hair. And it looks a bit like the spline factor from geometry nodes, a bit of foreshadowing. But here, if we use the mapping node, the X location will move the gradient along the curve. But as you can see, it's a single vector socket. To control this, plug a combined XYZ node. And this has sockets for all three. Now we can just plug the X into the input. However, when I uh, move this to the right, the white part increases and kind of goes uh, into the top of the hair. Whereas I feel that increasing this should make the black part uh, creep in from the top, from the root towards the tip of the hair. So let's make it so. If I bring a vector math node, uh, we can make it so instead of adding to the X coordinate, uh, we can subtract from it. So now when I increase this, the black creeps in from the top. Uh, but this uh, zero, zero, 0 state is, uh, well, this, and I want it to be all white. So let's move the X and see where, uh, yeah, it looks like at 1, it's all white. Now when we move this, the black comes in. Perfect. One last thing here is, uh, this is a linear gradient and mathematically it's perfectly linear, but to our eyes, it looks like there's this uh, cutoff right here where it's black and then the cut and the gradient starts from here. Uh, this is down to perception, but it kind of sticks to my eye. So change the linear gradient to easing. This will smooth in and out the gradient and will make it uh, much more pleasing to the eye. If you wish a tighter transition, uh, we can use a color ramp to crush the values. But when we do this, the harsh line is back. You can use ease on the ramp and it will smooth it a bit. But a trick I like to use is uh, set it to B-spline, which is even smoother. Then set the first flag at 0.25 and the second flag at 0.5 and this will tighten the transition roughly in half right there we go then we can use this as the factor between two colors 
bring a mix color node, uh, our gradient goes into the factor and it will mix uh, these two colors. I use this to make either a darker tint of the root or a highlight at the tip, but you can make anything. Set it to green and pink if you wish. After that, we can bring uh, our noise in another mix node. Set this one to overlay and the noise goes at the bottom slot. Now this controls this pattern. To give our hairstyle some uh, contextual shadows, it's nice to have some uh, ambient occlusion, but I find that the base AO is a bit anemic. Uh, it's there, but barely. We need to heavily crush that in a color ramp, B spline again, and set the first flag really high, like uh, 0.95 or something like that. Then in another mix node, set it to overlay, the AO goes at the bottom, and the factor controls how much uh, shadow we want. But overlay also lightens the white parts, and I want only shadows. So set the white part of the color ramp to a value of around uh, 0.6. So we have just a little highlight for contrast. Setting it to 0.5 will have uh, no effect on the brightness. To add a highlight or a little bit of shine to the outside of uh, the curves, we can use a layer weight node, the facing output, uh, which has this uh, really interesting effect. We can tweak it again with a color ramp and again it goes in the bottom socket of the mix, but this time set it to color dodge. We can use the same thing to add a fake uh, outer shadow effect. Set the mix uh, back to overlay for shadows, but flip the color ramp, and again change the value of the white flag to 0.6. If we take our noise texture and use it for roughness or spec, we need a way to control the levels. First is obviously a color ramp, but after it place a map range node, then these uh, two min and max values are the corresponding values for roughness of the black and white bands. So we output those and we're gonna restrict them to 0 to 1, because that's the normal range of uh, roughness and spec. For bump, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Noise goes into the height. Set the distance to the most that you think you're gonna use. For me, usually it's a 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And now the strength is our control, how much bump we want. Okay, here's the thing. Let's get back to the gradient. When I change it, uh, you see that it changes all of our hair strands. And it might look good on this one, but here it might not. I want to be able to control uh, on each hair strand individually. So no problem, right? Just make a new instance of the material. But now we have two materials. And if I want to change something on this one, I have to change it on the other. And also, if I have 30 or 40 strands, I'm not going to have 30 or 40 materials. That's ridiculous. I want to have one material and be able to control some parts of it on individual objects and some other parts globally for all objects that have the material. And this is what I talked about in the beginning of the video. We're going to use geometry nodes for that. There's this quirk of geometry nodes where if I have this value in the node tree, it's going to apply to every object that has that uh, geo nodes applied. Kind of like the shader, it applies to all that use the material. But if I output that value to the group input, now it's connected to the modifier. And even though they are connected, the value is not controlled from the node tree, but from the modifier. And this is cool because the modifier is going to be different for each object, so the value is going to be unique for each hairstyle. Now, how do we use this in the shader? First, we output the result here to the group output. Then let's just uh, give the input and output the same name. And if we look in the modifier, 
it's under output attributes. And here we have to give it a name. So we'll give it something relevant. I'll just put a gradient. Then in our shader, instead of connecting it to the input, we use a attribute node. Use the same name. And now this slider controls the gradient. Now to apply it to the other hair strands, uh, we select them all with the one with the modifier uh, active. Then click on this arrow and copy to select it. And then they should all have that control. And as you can see, it's unique for each hair, even though they all have the same material. Okay, let's make something more interesting. We can use the same technique to create this cool fading uh, in and out effect, individual for each hair, uh, that will simulate like the hairs spreading or like a more soft uh, ending for our hair strand. And this will show a more complicated approach to this technique uh, than just a single map range node. Okay, first we come to the geometry node tree. We're gonna add a capture attribute node and we're gonna work uh, on the spline factor. What I want is a creeping gradient from the tip and the root of the strand so that when I increase a value, I want these gradients to come uh, into the curve. So I'm gonna bring two map range nodes and I'm gonna output their values to the input. I'll call them fade in tip and fade in root. For the tip, I want to add this value to the factor of the curve. And now when I increase this, well, it's a bit difficult to see uh, because the white is coming in and it should be the black. So add a color ramp after and just flip it. And now it's the black creeping in. But we have to compress that quite a lot uh, around here for now. We can adjust this later. And this is what we want. However, when this is set to zero, you can still see some uh, black here. And I want it to be fully white at zero, no fading. We can adjust that with the map range. This is at zero, okay. And if I bring this min value lower uh, until the black disappears. So at around uh, negative uh, 0.2. Now if I set this to one, it's all the way black, which will disappear the entire curve. I want it to come uh, right uh, around the middle so that we have some range of control. So at one, we decrease the max value until the gradient uh, comes around the center of the curve. About this much. 0.5 will be fine. For the root, we subtract uh, the value from the factor and uh, naturally the gradient is correct. We're just gonna use the color ramp to compress the gradient and play with the values of the map range so, like the other one. Then we just uh, multiply these two together and this will be the gradient that we're gonna use in the shader. Just give it a name, fade. Back in the shader, uh, we're gonna grab our noise and multiply it with our fade attribute. However, I want more contrast uh, to these noise bands. So let's pass it through a color ramp. Then this result, we crush again with another color ramp for more contrast. And then we mix this with the pure white color and we use the attribute as a mix factor. And just to have uh, more control, we will add another color ramp to the factor. Finally, we take this result and we use it as a factor for a mix shader in which we're gonna mix our principal PSDF in the bottom socket and a transparent PSDF. And to see the result, we need to come to the material properties down here under settings, where it says uh, blend mode, change it to alpha hashed. And there we go. A few final things I like to add to the shader is uh, output the subsurface amount and color. And finally, to the group inputs, I'll add a new socket, change the type to color, 
and just copy it a few times. And this will serve as temporary color slots. Let's say I want to change this, uh, but I want to keep that color. I can drag it down here, change this, and if I don't like it, I can just bring this uh, color back. And yeah, these are some of the tricks that I regularly use. Uh, I hope that you have learned something and be able to apply that to your work. I really like the way we can control parts of our shader on an object-to-object -object basis. I'm sure you'll be able to find uh, many more uses for this technique. There is another way to control stuff around Blender, and it involves custom object properties. And in the next video, I'll show you how we can use them to erase a lot of the tedium of going around uh, in menus, uh, searching for settings to change. We can have a list of all the settings we want in one place. And I'm going to show you that by uh, making a custom camera rig that is going to be very useful when modeling from reference. Stay tuned.